So, but at least you, you all remember where I, I, was, I was up to. Okay, <coughs> where was I was up to was I'd, I'd created on R3 something which looked very much like the Durham complex. Okay, so it started in the same sort of way, except there was a question mark. <coughs> and then the, uh, the next two operators were, and then, and then I'm going to just tell you this, then, then do something a bit different. <coughs> First two operators were, here you had vector fields, which I, I was uh, denoting by x. And then this operator was something which I called the, the killing operator, and that gives you some symmetric something or other. So uh, a symmetric tensor. Okay, so, uh, and this operator was to take your vector field conveniently arranged with its, with its index down like that, rather than the vector field would have its index normally up. And it gives you the symmetric part of the matrix of partial derivatives. Okay, and I was going to tell you what this was. Okay, but first, let me not do that. <laughs> okay, so I'll stop here. <coughs> right, to be continued... And um, let me just say something about um, the, the uh, exercises, which you all had perhaps a chance to look at yesterday. And uh, right away, I have to apologise for exercise number two <coughs> and number three. Because although all of these three exercises, one, two, and three, are actually stated in elementary terms, um, <coughs> these are probably... Uh, difficult. I'll just put a, you know, an ex exclamation bar mark by them. Okay. So later, after we've we've uh, found a few more things, um, <coughs> two and three will become reasonably tractable. Number one, on the other hand, <coughs> should have been okay. I think number one <coughs> uh, was to try and determine in in R two. Um, so this one was in R two. Uh, this one was or R2 or R2 minus the origin. That's where number one was concerned. Number two and three, number two was concerned in, of something going on in R3 and this was something going on in R2. But number one was just concerned with, uh, with something happening in um, R2. And the something that was happening is you were trying to determine if you had a smooth, first of all, if you have a smooth function, you can look at its partial derivatives, <coughs> df by dx and df by dy. And number one was all trying to do with trying to figure out conditions on a couple of given smooth functions, which I call g and h, as to whether it's in the range of this mapping or not. Okay, so <coughs> uh, this is a very uh, hands-on uh, story on R2 with coordinates x and y, uh, but what's really going on is this, that this operator here is, <coughs> this gadget here is better written as <coughs> uh, df dx times this symbol dx plus <coughs> df dy by times this symbol dy. The reason is that when you do it that way, uh, you're in the language of differential forms. Okay, so this thing is a differential form, omega. And <coughs> the condition that to have something in the range of this, this, this now becomes the exterior derivative, this thing. And the condition to be in the range of this operator is precisely, locally anyway, precisely that d of omega should be equal to zero. And d of omega equal to zero is the compatibility condition which appears right at the uh, <coughs> beginning of the question. Okay, so this is a more advanced way of saying it. Right? And then what's really going on <coughs> in question number one, at least on, your, on R2, is you're trying to find a function f um, which uh, maps to this and one thing you can do, for example, in a completely elementary way, is you can start at the origin 
And you can approach any point, you can get to any point, for example, by going along a path like that for a while, and then a path like that for a while until you get to your desired point. And you can write down explicit integrals in terms of uh, just these functions uh, g and h. This is now called g, and this one was now called h in the, in the question. You look, write down explicit functions <coughs> which um, are just integrals along x while holding y fixed at 0, and then uh, integral in the, in the y direction while holding x fixed, and uh, get a proposed formula for f. Uh, this formula for f, by the way, will of course vanish at the origin, but that's no big deal because you can see that there's a freedom here in that you can replace f by any constant plus for f, f and it won't affect g and h. So without loss of general generality, you may as well be looking for a function which vanishes at the origin. And the only problem is, of course, you could do some other way of getting, you could, for example, do this. And the question is, why is it that when you integrate along this path to get to this point, or whether you integrate along this path to get to this point, you get the same answer? All right, so all, that, all of this is jazzed up a little bit, in that <coughs> um, with the language of differential forms, <coughs> what you do is you integrate along any path. And you're trying to show that the result when you integrate along any path is independent of your choice of path. So if you're trying to get to this point here, I'm not going to give anything names, I'm just drawing pictures. Right? You're integrating along a, a path omega. Then it turns out that you can integrate from the origin, that's this point here, to this other point, or xy, <coughs> xy, along any path. We may as well just integrate along this path omega, uh, sorry, gamma. And it turns out that everything has been set up correctly so that uh, uh, this integral is actually independent of choice of coordinates. And then the uh, statement that uh, it doesn't matter how you get there, roughly speaking, boils down to Stokes' theorem. If you had another way of getting to the same point, there's one path and here's another path, then because omega is closed, <coughs> the integral along the boundary here, so if, let's say if you do that and go right back to the origin, the integral along the boundary is the same by Stokes' theorem as some integral in the inside. And it's the integral on the inside is d of omega. So d of omega equals zero is precisely what you need in order for this process to make sense. Okay, so this is number one said in the language of differential forms. And then there was an example also in question one, and that is on r2 minus the origin. <coughs> so if you take out the origin, then you could consider this differential form. Well, it's written out explicitly in the... Uh, in the question, but what, what it really is, is it's this differential form. It's uh, x dy minus y dx in this new language over x squared plus y squared. Okay, of course, you need to be away from the origin in order for this to make sense. Um, but the claim is, even though this is closed, you, so you can check that this is closed, d omega equals zero, <coughs> But you cannot write this omega as d of something. And the real, real reason for that is exactly the same reason that in uh, Pervy's talk, that uh, 1 over z is not approximal, approximable in the um, complex plane by polynomials. Right? And her reason was that if you integrate this around a closed curve around the origin, you get non-zero. You get something non-zero. You get 2 pi i. Okay, so really what you're supposed to do in order to make this a bit more of an invariant statement is you're integrating uh, dz over z around the origin and you get 2 pi i. And this thing here is secretly uh, this form. Okay, let, let, me, let me just compute that to make sure. Right, so <coughs> in standard coordinates, <coughs> dz over z is equal to, I'll just multiply top and bottom by z conjugate, is equal to z conjugate dz divided by z conjugate z. <coughs> right, and now in usual xy coordinates, uh, z bar is x minus iy. Uh, dz is dx plus I, d, 
dy. And the bottom is x squared plus y squared. Right, it's looking fairly hopeful. It's got the same thing on the, on the, on the, on the bottom. Okay, and then this is equal to, well, it has a real part and the imaginary part. The real part is just um, x dx uh, plus y dy divided by x squared plus y squared. And then there's an imaginary part, and the imaginary part is actually exactly this, this gadget over here. It's uh, x dy minus y dx over x squared plus y squared. Right, so this, this thing is our mystery god gadget called omega. And <coughs> this thing here is something else. Now, this one here is, is, is actually d of something. Right, so this is just d of uh, log of um, x squared plus y squared. Um, yeah, well, <coughs> okay. <laughs> well, actually, actually, this one's a bit of a problem. <laughs> Well, no, that one, that one has zero at the end. Okay, Th this is a bit of a problem anyway. But this one is a problem. Let me, let me concentrate on this one and say why it is that this one is a problem. Okay, the great thing about differential forms is you can mindlessly um, write them in other coordinates. Okay, so what you do is you write this thing in polar coordinates. You write x equals, uh, well, let's just write, let's just see what happens on the circle. You get right, just... Uh, x equals sine theta and y equals sine, uh, sine uh, cos theta and sine theta. So you're going around the circle, see what happens. Substitute into that over there, and it's a completely mindless thing to do. The really good thing about this dx, dy, and dy notation and stuff like that is that um, <coughs> the following sort of thing makes sense. You can just apply d to both sides, and you get uh, dx is equal to... <coughs> um, derivative of uh, cosine is minus sine d theta, and uh, dy is equal to cosine theta d theta. And these make perfectly good sense as differential forms. And then if I compute what I have over here, so x dy minus y dx, <coughs> you'll find that, uh, well, x dy gives you cosine squared times d theta. Okay, so omega then becomes cosine squared times cosine squared of theta, d theta. And then the other one, because of the sign change, because plus sine squared theta, d theta, divided by cosine squared plus sine squared. And even if you didn't know that cosine squared plus sine squared was equal to 1, which it is, right, these things cancel out, and you get d theta. OK, now, of course, what's really going on here is that this change of coordinates, which is perfectly OK locally, is not OK globally. And <coughs> what's happening is that uh, you're trying to parameterize the, uh, the part of the... You're trying to parameterize um, the uh, outside of the, of the origin, the, the, um, you know, the punctured plane. You're trying to parameterize it by uh, theta. And the other, other thing you would include is, is r, OK? So this is actually, yeah, this is perfectly OK. This is R squared, which is perfectly OK away from the origin, right? But <coughs> theta is a problem, right? Because this coordinate system is only valid locally. And when you go around here, you're obliged to increase theta by 2, two pi, right? And then, you know, that's, that's not a valid coordinate change. Locally, it's fine. So then, and the real problem is that when you integrate this thing around this circle, this, this uh, d theta now, it's become just d theta on the circle, then <coughs> you get just the integral of, of d theta between theta equals 0 and 2 pi, let's say, and that's 2 pi, which is not equal to 0, which is why it cannot be written as uh, <coughs> d of a function. Okay, so the breakdown of this coordinate system is if is, is, is responsible exactly for this, this uh, problem. Right, so that's what's going on in question one, really. Um, ah, yes. Actually, let, let me just, just say a few words about... Uh, ah, actually, right, OK. Yeah, what's really going on in question one <laughs> is that, of course, you're talking about how the geometry of this, of this is affecting what's happening with the Durham complex. And this thing here, 
um, has some so-called cohomology groups. Okay, what's really going on, if you really want to track this down, is that H1 of this, <coughs> of this punctured plane with coefficients in R, is <coughs> not equal to zero. So in fact, it's equal to R. Right, so it's not equal to zero. So I don't, you know, don't, don't expect you to know what this means, but <coughs> you're led to this sort of, these sorts of con considerations. And you might think this is, this is uh, perfectly innocent and has nothing to do with the real world, but that's not true. So, <laughs> okay, what you can do is you can create an experiment um, in a lab whereby you uh, get a couple of, uh, couple of solenoids which are creating magnetic fields. And <coughs> what you do is you arrange that these magnetic fields, so it's happening in R3, but really it's just a, a, a question about what's happening in a, in a, in a, in a cylinder, e extrapolated, right? So, you can, you can arrange a couple of magnetic fields uh, <coughs> by means of some electromagnet on the outside of this and, and something pretty close to the middle here. So uh, the fields themselves cancel, okay, in the middle. Okay, so in other words, if you, if you try and see whether there's any magnetic field whatsoever here by traditional means, which means you're the moving around little wires and see whether it generates any current or anything like that, you find it doesn't. Right, so there's no field here. The field is equal to zero. Field, whatever that means. Electromagnetic field is identically equal to zero here. However, <coughs> when you turn the electricity on to these two solenoids, <coughs> um, you could actually see something happening. And to see it happening, what you do is you stand over here with a, with a, a source of electrons <coughs> and you fire them towards the cylinder. And just before you get there, you split it into two beams and you recombine them over here. And <coughs> if there were nothing going on, you would see no change in the interference pattern that which you generate over here when you turn the current on. But when you turn the current on, you find the interference patterns change. So somehow, although, the f although these, these things are passing through, you can just arrange that these, these beams are passing through something which apparently has no field whatsoever, then <coughs> there's a change, right? So this is why physicists are led to um, gauge theory and stuff like that, <laughs> okay? So, so, so in, in, our, in our terminology here, d omega <coughs> is like the field, whereas omega itself is really a, a, a potential for something that's happening, okay? I, I will stop now. I'm getting a bit carried away on that. So <coughs> let's now... Just one thing about question number two. Okay, so here's question number two. <coughs> and that was, question number two was something, because it just relates to something that, uh, that Francine was saying. So question number two um, <coughs> concerned what happens, the f very first part is concerned with what happens if you have a function which satisfies the following two equations. So df dx, suppose df dx is equal to zero, and, uh, and then the coordinates here are t, x, and y, right, plus um, x df dy is equal to zero. The very first part of the question is to show that if, the, if these equations hold, then f is constant, right? So how, how do you do that? Actually, whenever you see a sort of you know, operator like this, perhaps a good idea, give a good idea to give it a name. Let's write x for this vector field. And this <coughs> vector field, let's call it y. Later in the question, that's what we do. So this is uh, d by dt plus <coughs> x d by dy. So what you're really asking is if you've got a function which is annihilated by these two fields, show that it's constant. And the point is that if you've got something which is annihilated by a couple of fields like this, it's actually annihilated by the Lie bracket as well. Right? So, as Francine said, that's just, um, <coughs> it's just a repeated application of x and y and then the other way around. But anyway, if it's annihilated by x and y, it's annihilated by the Lie bracket. And you can see that the Lie bracket in this particular case is, <coughs> well, it's just when that hits that, it's g by dy. Okay, so 
<coughs> immediately you conclude that if you've got something which is killed by X and Y, it's also killed by this. Right, let's call this thing Z, as it's called in, in, the, in the question. So now you've got something which is annihilated by three vector fields rather than two, which is more appropriate to R3. And these vector fields are linearly independent everywhere. That's why it's zero. So it's, it's partial derivatives in all directions at all points is equal to zero. Right, so it implies that f is constant. So if you, if you ever encounter vector fields like this, which have this property, that if you create more vector fields by taking their Lie bracket, you get all of the, all of the tangent space like that. This is called a bracket generating, a bracket gener generating distribution. So anyway, that's what's happening at the start of question two. And now, now I'm going to stop because I'm not going to tell you anything more about question two. We'll come back to that later. Um, now, <coughs> now I do promise that I'll tell you how to work out this question mark, but not quite yet. Okay, so let me. Um, Again, link up what I'm saying with what other people have been saying. All right, so I'm going to talk about complex manifolds, just briefly. So this is an interlude. Uh, if you look at the notes, so if you follow the link which is now on the website, you will come to <coughs> uh, this file, which I'll just keep on updating. These are rough, very rough notes on what I've been saying. And there's exercises one, which from yesterday, and there's exercises two, so that they'll be labelled by the day. Right, but in these notes here, there's an interlude on complex analysis, which goes like this. So um, I'll just uh, make sure I'm getting my notation, everything the same. Right, what about a complex manifold? Right, so everybody defines a complex manifold as something which is um, <coughs> locally like Cn for some n, fixed n, and that the transition functions are holomorphic. Um, but if you're a hardcore differential geometry, a g differential geometer, you'd like to do it in a sort of much more um, abstract way. Okay, so I will, I will do that now in a much more abstract way. And instead of defining a complex manifold that way, I'll define a complex manifold in a different way. And first, by first defining an almost complex manifold. The terminology here is definitely a bit screwed up, by the way. <coughs> but we're stuck with it. <laughs> right, so perhaps we should call complex manifolds, we should call them holomorphic manifolds, because the change of coordinates is holomorphic. And uh, complex, you know, when talk, people talk about com complex vector bundles, they mean something different. So anyway, we're stuck with this terminology. What is an almost complex manifold? Right, so it's a smooth manifold, M. Everything is smooth. But the thing that it has that distinguishes it from being uh, just any manifold, it has some extra structure. Now, normally, when you're talking about extra structure on a manifold, you're talking about some some tensor or something like that. In this case, it's an endomorphism, J. <coughs> this is a homomorphism from the tangent bundle of M to itself, which satisfies that J squared is equal to minus the identity. Right, now <coughs> I'll just say in words, without writing on, on the board, where this comes from. Right, so, for example, if you're trying to uh, define a complex vector space and you don't want to talk about complex numbers because you're, you're, you're allergic to them or something like that, what you can do is talk about a real vector space, which everybody's very happy with, and you can equip it with an endomorphism like this. Now, if you do that, you find <laughs> you've, uh, you've <coughs> inadvertently given it a complex structure because um, <coughs> if, if you have a complex vector space, you can define um, an endomorphism by multiplication by i. Right? And i squared is equal to minus 1. So this is just a, a reflection in terms of this endomorphism of what's happening when you're thinking of a real vector space as a complex vector space endowed with some extra structure. It's exactly this. Okay? 
So now here's a, a version on a manifold. And that's an almost complex manifold. Right, now <coughs> let me now revert to, I mean this is supposed to be a course about complexes of differential operators. I will revert to my favourite complex of differential operators, namely the Durham complex. I'm going to need a bit of space, so let me just erase all this. but not that, because we're going to come back to that. So now, in, in the presence of such a J, I would like you to contemplate the Durham complex. Right, so the Durham, Durham complex, let's just start it with functions. This is my notation for smooth functions, roughly speaking. Uh, this is my notation for one forms. This is what happens if you take D of a function. And so on. So this is like grad curl, but done in n dimensions in a, in a coordinate free way. Right, so <laughs> let's look at this, this uh, complex in the presence of uh, something like that. Now, at the moment, everything is just real. This is just a real manifold. Nobody's ever mentioned complex numbers at the moment. And these are real valued forms. These are real valued uh, differential forms. Now, <coughs> you can, if you like, consider complex valued differential forms on your manifold instead of real valued. Right? You just write down exactly the same formulae for how these things transform or so on but you just have them locally have values in the complex numbers rather than the real numbers. So <coughs> let's now look at complex valued differential forms. All right, so the fancy way of saying that is you're going to tensor this thing by C. All right, so I'll just say it in the fancy way. This is a series of, this is a series of real vector bundles and blah, blah, blah. This is, uh, I'm going to take this series and just tensor it with C. When you do that, well, nothing very interesting happens here. Um, the only interesting thing that happens is I'm going to give this thing a new notation. I'm <laughs> going to call it uh, lambda zero, zero. And the reason is that an interesting thing happens now here. Uh, because j squared is equal to minus one, it has no exciting, uh, no exciting eigenvalues. But if you uh, look at this as a complex matrix instead of a real matrix, it has two eigenvalues, and they are plus and minus i. And that enables you to break up this bundle into two bundles. Let's call these bits uh, 0, 1, uh, 0, 1, and 1, 0. There they are. So this, this, this bundle, which used to be you know, an irreducible bundle, nothing, it's just broken up automatically into these two parts because of, because of j. Um, this, is, this, is, this is something, when you think of real things as, as complex, this is something that which sort of you, you get snuck by you as, a, as, a, as an undergraduate, right? So, for example, suppose you're trying to prove that a real symmetric matrix is orthogonally diagonalizable, right? How do you know it's even got any real eigenvalues, right? You, you don't. So what people do is they say, well, look at this real, real symmetric matrix, and we'll think of it just as mapping complex numbers to complex numbers instead of real numbers, right? Complex vectors. Then it's got eigenvalues. Of course it does, because every matrix has va eigenvalues, right? and so on, right? So you, ex you, you do a little excursion into the complex realm, and then you come back and you interpret your results in a real way. Same thing happens in algebraic geometry, more generally. Okay, anyway, this one breaks up like that. This thing here also breaks up. And how it breaks up, well, actually, as soon as you've got something broken up like this, and you take wedge of it, the result breaks up into wedge of this, this times this, this tends to this, and wedge of that. Okay, and these things have notations. All right, so... Whoops. Okay, so it breaks up like that. But now I'm, th this is just how these things break up as algebra. And, you know, the question is, how does this decomposition interact with the exterior derivative? Right? 
So, of course, the first bit breaks up into two differential operators. <coughs> they have names. This one is called D, and this one is called D bar. Actually, there's sort of no name for D. It's just... <laughs> there's a name for this one. It's D bar. Right, but there's no name for that one. But it's, like, it, it's written like that. You just can't pronounce it. Right, and then there's a question of what happens here. And a priori, what happens here is there are, there are, let's see, six different possible mappings, right? You can go from here to here, there to there, there to there, there to there, there to there, and there to there. Right? There's, there's, uh, there's possible six different mappings. Um, but if you, if you check, and this is just using the Leibniz rule, uh, to check that this thing here, <coughs> although it looks a priori like a differential operator, it's not. Right? It's simply a homomorphism of vector bundles. And I'm going to give it a name, and I'll call it N. Right? And <coughs> I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it as a uh, more advanced exercise to check that N is a homomorphism. So N is a homomorphism. The way to check it is to check that it's linear over the functions, but is a homomorphism. Any of these things which turn out to be like uh, the Levy form and things like that, which are defined in terms of differentiation, but, but which turn out to be just uh, algebra, they all, they all go about by checking that things um, are linear over the functions. But anyway, N is a homomorphism. And roughly speaking, it has a name. So this is roughly speaking. That's why it's not equal to. It's roughly speaking the so-called uh, Ninehaus tensor. Ninehaus tensor. Right. And then people define... Well, well no, no, they, they don't really. But <coughs> this is one way of defining a complex manifold. You can define it to be all this, all this stuff so that this tensor vanishes. Right, so if you want to define a complex manifold now, it's <coughs> just such that this gadget n is identically equal to zero. Right, and this seems a bit of a weird thing to do. Right, <coughs> so first of all, I should come a bit clean about what's going on here. This n homomorphism from here to here uh, there's a, a similar homomorphism, of course, from there to there by symmetry, but they're related. They're related by complex conjugation. If you, con if you conjugate something in here, you get something in here. If you conjugate something in there, you get something in there. So if you start in here, you do conjugation n conjugation, you get something in there. So this n here is part of something which is really real. So if you Google Neuenhaus tensor and look on Wikipedia, you'll find a real tensor, not one of these things. Okay? But it's the same. It's the same thing, really, okay? in disguise. Um, <coughs> actually, the extent to which it is in disguise is carefully spelled out in one of the, um, one of the PDF files here. So um, <coughs> let me explain <coughs> why it is that you can define a complex manifold by saying all this stuff and having the Neuenhaus tensor be identically zero. Well, of course, this is very nice, but it's actually, in order to check that this agrees with one's common sense definition of a complex manifold, that's a deep theorem. That's the Newlander-Nuremberg theorem. So the question is, if you've got such a thing, you know, why are there any holomorphic functions at all? Right, in, in this language, oh, by the way, this, this, is, this is, roughly speaking, this is the, uh, the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So this would be the Cauchy-Riemann operator on a, manif on a complex manifold, on a CR manifold, as uh, Francine has been describing. It's a similar sort of story. So these are the Cauchy-Riemann equations <coughs> on, on your manifold. To be in the kernel of this is to say that you've got um, a holomorphic function, but... You know, if, if, I just, if I just give you all this structure, there's no reason to suppose that there are any holomorphic functions at all. Right? So <coughs> it's fairly deep theorem to even find out that there are any holomorphic functions at all from this point of view. This deep theorem is called the Newlander-Nuremberg theorem. And you can prove it by Hermander's L2 methods if you like. Uh, 
Right, this, is in the, uh, this is in the smooth category. So if you're starting with a, a um, M which is just smooth and you're trying to prove this, right, then you're in for some serious work. If, however, everything is real analytic instead, then it's easy. So let me just describe why it's easy in the real analytic setting. And you'll see why N is such a, a, good, a good condition. Okay, so now let's look at the real analytic setting. All right, so this is our a digression which is aimed at illustrating the difference between uh, smooth things and things which are more controlled by geometry. In the real analytic setting, you can control everything by geometry. So here is an interesting fact, right, which I'm going to use. So if you've got a, a, a real analytic manifold, M, uh, what you can do is you can think of it as just, well, it's given by, uh, smooth uh, it's given by transition functions from patch to patch, which are not just smooth, as they would be for a smooth manifold, but they're given by convergent power series. So what you can do is you can put those, um, you can just take those convergent power series and just feed complex numbers into them rather than real numbers. And when you do that, you find you get a perfectly sensible manifold at least nearby to this thing, which has twice the dimension and is a, hollow, is a you know, regular old complex manifold in the usual sense. So in other words, you can take this thing and you can embed it in its so-called complexification. Right? So this is something which really depends on the real, analy real analytic setting. Okay, so this is... Uh, some trick, some 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 issues here to check that this is Hausdorff as a anyway, but it was accomplished by uh, who was it? 1959, anyway. So sort of fairly recently. <laughs> okay, so you've got a real analytic manifold now sitting inside a its complexification, uh, and it's just like locally, it's just like taking R n and sitting it inside C n. Right? It's just locally modelled on exactly that. Right, so Whit Whitney was one of them. Whitney and someone in 1959. Right, now, in the real analytic setting, I don't just mean that you're starting with a manifold which is real analytic. That's all you need in order to play this game. Um, but also, we're going to suppose that J, which is this... Uh, this uh, endomorphism of the tangent bundle, is also real an analytic. Right? So it means that in this particular coordinate system, which I've chosen in order to say that this is real analytic, uh, J <coughs> is, its uh, coefficients depend real analytically on these variables. And so you could extend J too. Right? So J also extends <coughs> right? real analytically. Um, just as when you've got Rn sitting inside Cn, all of these analytic extensions, they're unique. Right? If, you've got, if you've got something which is holomorphic on Cn and it vanishes on Rn, it's just zero. Right? So J also extends. And what does it extend to? It extends to the, the uh, tangent bundle, to this new manifold that we've created. Right, so <coughs> J is now from the tangent bundle of the complexification to the tangent bundle of the complexification. And J is now holomorphic. Right? Everything is now holomorphic. Um, this thing here, if you just restrict it back to EB, it's exactly the complexified tangent bundle. Right? So this is just, if you restrict it to M, if you take the... <coughs> it's just the complexified tangent bundle to M. Right, so now <coughs> this is this is incredibly confusing, by the way. When you <laughs> when you when you try and you know when you try and do this for the first time, you will uh, you know <coughs> you will freak yourself out because you know secretly secretly what we've got in the background here, what we're trying to show is we've got a complex manifold. Who in their right mind would complexify something which is already complex? I mean, it's just nuts, right? But <coughs> this this actually you're not thinking about that way. Right, you're thinking of M as giving you something real and you're doing this. Right, what happens? So, 
um, what happens is that <coughs> all of these previous statements about n and so on, they all extend uniquely to the complexification. It, it show, it sh what it shows you eventually is that um, if you look at the, the dual gadgets, T01 of complex, oh, T, T01, uh, and then complexify that, or T10, and complexify that. All of these things go just straight away as complex bundles into this new complex manifold in the traditional sense which we have invented, this thing. Right, and now I'll draw a picture. <laughs> okay, so the picture is you've got M sitting inside <coughs> its complexification. So here's M. And of course, this, this, blackboard, this whiteboard has nowhere near enough dimension for, you to, for me to convince you of what's going on here. Right, but <coughs> this is M, which is n-dimensional. And this is its complexification, which has twice the number of dimensions. <coughs> and... You know, it, it only really matters what's going on nearby M. Okay, so now you ask, what does it mean for this Neuenhaus tensor to be identically zero in terms of uh, these bundles here, which have now been ex extended into the complex? Right, so this gadget here extends as a, as, a, as a complex bundle, and so does the other one as a holomorphic bundle. And it means that if you take a couple of things in here and take their Lie bracket, you get back into here. So these things are closed. And everything is in the holomorphic category now under Lie bracket. Right, now it takes a little bit of an effort, but not, you know, not a lot, to show that that's equivalent to the vanishing of the Neuenhaus tensor. So these things here, the great thing about these things here is that they now have a geometric interpretation in this complexification. They used to be just uh, sub-bundles of the complexified tangent bundle, but now they're sub-bundles of an actual bundle, namely the tangent space to this thing. Okay, so these things here, and, and, and you know, they have no real points at all. They always point off into the complex. Let's look at this one, for example. This one here defines at every point, not only on M, but nearby M, it defines a, a sub-bundle, and that sub-bundle is closed under Lie bracket. Now there's a theorem. So if you've got a sub-bundle of any smooth bundle or any holomorphic bundle, works in either category, that is closed under Lie bracket, then it's actually part of a foliation. Right? So what you conclude is that there are actually holomorphic, there's an actual holomorphic foliation which is transverse to your original manifold. Now, this, this takes some thinking about, but this is a holomorphic foliation. <coughs> right, and it points in a different direction. It just goes straight out of your manifold. And so now you can create holomorphic coordinate patches on M from this picture, because what you do is you look at this holomorphic foliation. It has exactly half the dimension. Right, and so you, look, you just pick a, some little transverse patch over here, Right, so that's just something, something in CM, which uh, has the property that all of these fibers at least you know, locally go through exactly one point. And <coughs> you use this picture to view this little, you know, perfectly good uh, part of CN now, locally, as a coordinate patch on your original manifold. Right, and you've got to think about this very carefully to make sure I'm not, I'm not lying, but this really is true. And by the way, this works in the CR setting as well. Okay, so anything that's real, real analytic and this, or a real analytic CR manifold, and it's integrable in a suitable sense, is um, <coughs> automatically um, directly related to complex analysis. Right, that's what's going on here. Okay, that was my interlude on complex manifolds. Right, so, something to think about. But the point, I mean, the point is, you know, that you know, many, many of these things you can see by looking at 
you know, complexes of differential operators. In this particular case, it's just the Durham complex. So, now let's get back to this question mark. I know you're all dying to know. All right. Right, is this. Right, so all I want to do for the moment is tell you uh, how to go about finding the kernel of this. That's what we're after for question mark. Okay, so what is the kernel of what I've been calling the killing operator? What is the kernel of the killing I don't think this little button does anything at all. Killing operator. Operator. Right, these things have names. They're called killing fields, right? Because they're vector fields. Right, so this, what, whatever it is, these things are called killing fields. Right, so this is a, um, a technique which works in many situations. Um, and what you do is you take your original differential equation and for various reasons I'm going to call x a different a diff by a different letter now. I'm going to call it sigma. So everything is going to look like some sort of form. So I take my original differential equation, which looks like that. And I say, And I look at it and I say, oh, it's a shame. I don't know all of the derivatives of sigma. Right? I only know this symmetric, symmetrized part of the derivatives. So, in order not to be too disappointed, you invent names for the things you don't know. Right? So you say that this is the same as saying that the derivatives of sigma are equal to, and then you just give it a name, right? where this is skew, where mu is skew. Skew name is skew. Right, so, so, f so far nothing is happening at all. The wheels are spinning. Right, but <coughs> I claim that you can actually figure out, from the original uh, differential equation, you can figure out differential consequences on the things that you've introduced. Right, so I'll just say it in words, and I'll give, you, I'll give this, uh, this procedure a name. It's called prolongation. So prolongation is whereby you have a system of equations, differential equations, which you're interested in. Right? In order to try and get a handle on the solutions here, you invent names for the things you don't know, and you try and figure out differential con consequences on those things. Right? And this particular one is, again, all to do with the Durham complex. Right? Because you note, <coughs> if you like, on, on, on the side that if mu has this property, then actually, uh, what is mu? It's actually just the exterior der derivative of sigma, and in particular, its exterior derivative of better vanish. So in other words, if you take a further derivative of mu, like this, and you skew over all three indices, you get zero. Right, so that's just saying that d, that's another way of saying d squared is equal to zero. Remember, this is just partial derivative in R3. Right, nothing complicated going on here. Right, so <coughs> this thing is, is, is equal to zero as a consequence just of that. We've not yet used this. We've only used that in writing down this equation. But this is just, even if this were just the skew part of this, which it is, this would still be true. Right? <coughs> so then you rewrite this. And you say, ah, oh, look, <coughs> I'm going to, going to rewrite this. It looks like it's got six terms because, you know, six, <coughs> six is how many elements there are in the symmetric group on three letters and we're symmetrizing. In general, that's true. But here, because mu is already skew in B and C, there are only three terms. And this, this means, when you write it out in more detail, that this is equal to... Um, so here I'll just interchange, well, first thing I'll do is interchange, say, I can just take the indices in any other order, but I'm go going to conveniently write the A index on the N here. Right, so I'm going to take 
A and actually interchange it with, 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 with C to start with. Let's do that. Okay, so that's, that's one term. And then you get minus uh, C A. All right, so using the fact that mu is skew, uh, that equation there becomes this equation here. Right? And then you substitute back in what mu actually is. Right? So mu is defined to be just the uh, derivative of sigma. That's how it arose to start. You su just substitute that back in, and what you get is <coughs> an equation only involving sigma now. So if you eliminated mu from the right-hand side, you have only sigma. Sigma A. Right. And because we're in flat space, right, because these are, just, these are just partial derivatives, these things commute. This is C and B in that order. That's the same thing in the other order. Everything just cancels and you get zero. Right. So at this point, you can actually just write down what the general solution is here. So in, 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 in any dimension, not only in three dimensions, this works in any dimensions, you can say that, right, because this is equal to zero, you can figure out that this gadget here has to be constant. Right? There, I mean, the point is that what's happened now is this system has closed. Right? You've invented new names for the things you didn't know, called mu, but now you know all of the derivatives of sigma and all of the derivatives of mu, so it's a closed system. I mean, you can conclude that this thing here is constant. Right? And then you feed that back in. You feed that back out in what mu is to this, which is how mu is defined, and you'll find you figure out what sigma is. And the result is, at the, the end, that sigma A is equal to, uh, let's call these constants M. So it's M A B X B, where remember I'm using Einstein summation convention, and my coordinates have upper indices, plus, let's say, um, R, A. <coughs> okay, and you, and you, you sort of recognize this has something to do with the symmetries of Euclidean space, because these are, I mean, let's, let's, <coughs> let's be a bit, more, a bit more explicit about what's going on here. This is, I'm telling you what a vector field is. This is a vector field is equal to, so I'm just raising the indices, M, A, uh, B, X, B, D by D, X, A. That's the more, well, yeah, that's the more correct way of writing it, so the indices are in the sort of the right order, uh, plus R, A, D by D, X, A. And these things now have a, a geometric interpretation. This is an infinitesimal version of rotations, these are vector fields. They generate what? These generate rotations. <coughs> and these generate translations. And either from that point of view or just by linear algebra, the dimension of this thing is a finite dimensional vector space. And its dimension is, uh, dimension is 3 for the translations and <coughs> 3 for the rotations. Uh, in R3, uh, and, uh, and, or alternatively, you know, skew forms in three dimensions. With its index down, this would be skew. <coughs> this has, um, is a three-dimensional vector space. All right, so total of six. Okay, so whatever else is going on here, is, this is a finite dimensional vector space, and I've just figured out its dimension is six. So this is dimension six. OK, now, this, this um, prolongation and so on uh, doesn't only tell you um, how to determine the kernel of this thing, but it, tell, it tells you much, much more. This is your starting point for a proper investigation of uh, this differential operator. Right, so let me, let me just sort of uh, start on that. I'll just start on it very briefly and then change tr track a little bit. Again, let's see where we're up to with time. Probably not much left now. Four minutes. Okay, <coughs> what you should do is 
you should assemble these differential equations here, this one and this one, into something which is much more uh, suggestive. Right, so what you're going to do now is, instead of looking at si sigma and mu uh, as separate gadgets, I'm going to assemble them into one gadget. Right, so this thing here is going to be lying in a vector bundle, which consists of one forms and two forms just put together in this trivial way. This thing here I'm going to call E, new vector bundle. And <coughs> this, these differential equations, what you should do is think of them as uh, solutions of, I'll just as assemble this thing by taking this thing to, um, well, just this. Exa exactly, I'm just going to take this. As, a, as another sort of vector of the same form. Now, where does this lie? Right, this has got an A index on it, but apart from that, its indices just look exactly like that. So what's really going on is you're mapping this to one forms tensor E. Right, this scary tensor product sign is just that in tensors, it just means that you're looking at things with which have indices, and the indices are from here and from here. E, but E is, is, is two bundles together. So what you're developing here is a differential operator from E to one forms tensor E. And confusingly, I'll give it a name <laughs> and I'll call it Nabla. All, all, my, uh, all my differential operators are pretty much called Nabla. But this one here is a very nice, very nice Nabla. It's called a connection. Right, so this is a connection. Right, so in order to proceed, I'd really have to, I'd really have to discuss um, connections on vector bundles and especially their curvature. Right, whatever that means. Okay, so now there's a, a whole machinery out there ready, ready and waiting to go from differential geometry, which includes connections, curvature, and some other gadgets. Now, I see I've run out of time to really pursue this today, but in the notes, there's just a list of key words at this point. The key words are vector bundle, uh, connection, uh, torsion, and curvature. There's uh, some notation to be introduced, and then there's... Uh, the next, next thing to, to actually embark upon in order to properly understand what's going on here is a bit of differential geometry where these connections and so on are very special. Right, that's called Riemannian. That's the end of the talk. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'll ask my phone to snooze a little bit. Uh, <coughs> this is the next thing. Next topic is Riemannian differential geometry. Right, and Riemannian differential geometry is a bit like my viewpoint on complex manifolds. It's just we've got some extra structure on the manifold. The extra structure is a so-called Riemannian metric, and it, you just sort of see how far you can take this. Right, so I'll have a bit of a rave about that tomorrow. Okay, but for now, that's it.